morning, everybody. Welcome to First Baptist Church and Sauna Company. We're glad you could be here today. Uh, don't think of it as just church. It's church and a weight loss program. We've got working right now. So uh, you're welcome. You're welcome. I'm glad to do that for you. Uh, you have a bulletin if you want to take that out. And uh, there's a place where the scripture for today is, as well as a place you can jot down some notes if you want to do that. We're in a series. We started last week. Pastor Wayne started the series. It's called um, You Are Here. And it's the basic premise of how do I understand where I am in relationship to God. So I want to pray. We're going to dive right in. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this time. We would just pray right now, Lord, that you would use this morning for your glory. We pray, Father, that uh, you would bring all things together for yourself. And I just thank you for the love that you have for each person who is here. Guide us now, we pray, Lord. Help our hearts to be sensitive to hear what you want them to hear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, I'm going to have you guys do a little exercise, okay? Not like physical exercise. Just a little imaginary exercise. I want you to imagine that you are on a boat, small boat, it's just you. And through a course of circumstances, you find yourself in this boat bobbing up and down on a nameless body of water, some nameless sea. You look in all four directions and all you see is water. You have no idea where you are. You could be in the Atlantic, you could be in the East China Sea, you could be in Lake Michigan, you don't know. All you know is that you're surrounded by water. You don't want to be there. You want to find land. You want to get where it's safe, where you, you know the terrain. But there you are, bobbing up and down, up and down, up and down. And every place you look, you see the same thing, water. I want to start with that word picture, that, that image because a lot of us today, a lot of people today, feel just like that when they start thinking about God. I mean, after all, there's so many philosophies out there. There's, there's all kinds of worldviews and ideas. If, if you go to, to one church or congregation of some kind, a religious group, you learn one thing. You go someplace else, you learn something else. It's just this vast sea of ideas about God, about life worldviews and philosophies and, and theologies and all of this stuff. And, and the question is, how do I know what I believe in all of this? How do I know where I am in relation to God? If you start with, with endless amounts of philosophies and ideas, I, I don't even know if I believe in God at this point. So how do, I, how do I move from where I am, how do I understand where I am, and begin to move towards God? Now, go back to the boat. You're in the boat. You're bobbing up and down. You don't know where you are. You just know you're on some nameless body of water. Well, it just so happens, if you can begin to find objects, and you can figure out your position in relationship to them, you can begin to pinpoint exactly where you are. If you find three different objects, you can begin to find where they cross your relationship to them. And as you do this, finding these three objects in your relationship, these are called lines of position, you can go from not knowing where you are on planet Earth to pinpointing yourself within one nautical mile. If you're really good, half a mile. You just got to find objects and figure out where you are in relationship to them. Now, you're in the boat, you're bobbing up and down, it's the middle of day, you see nothing but water, so you find your eyes moving up and you see the most obvious thing in the sky. During the day, what is the most obvious thing in the sky? The sun. I'm ignoring this side right now. You see the sun, you can't miss it, you feel the heat. You see the brightness? It's impossible to miss. Now, last week, Pastor Wayne talked about that. And he said the, the most obvious thing when we begin in this whole sea of ideas is you sort of see the sun, the biggest thing. And what he brought that to is that the first thing we begin with is God exists. That's where it all begins. God exists. So how do I know that? Because I see creation. 
because of conscience. No matter where you go in the world, throughout all of history, there are some things that people know are right and wrong, no matter how you slice it. It doesn't matter their religion, doesn't matter their origin, doesn't matter anything, because God has planted a conscience in people. Now, we can shut that conscience off. That conscience has kind of fallen. You can also look around, and you can have no idea what you believe about anything, but you can see the complexities of nature, as fallen as it is, as broken as it is, as different as God intended it to be in the beginning, and you can still say, there's got to be something out there. There is a creator. There is a God. There's a, there's a, you know, a, a first cause. Something made all of what I see. So the first line of position, like the sun in the sky, is that God exists. Today I want to talk about what the second line of position is. If you want to jot this down, you can do so. Just write up at the top of your notes. The first line is that God exists. He's there. He's real. And that begins to eliminate a lot of other things. Now, obviously, we could spend months talking about reasons for why God exists. We could talk about just creation and look at all of the intricacies of that. By the way, there's books pouring out. One right now called Darwin's Doubt is a New York Times bestseller written by Stephen Meyer. It basically has the premise of when Darwin was writing Origin of the Species in the 1800s, he had one big doubt about his whole theory, which is really just a model, a model of origins. And the doubt was, what do you do in the Cambrian, what's known as the Cambrian explosion, when suddenly you have massive amounts of animal forms, but they don't have ancestors going back? It doesn't fit the model of evolution. Meyer's book is all about that, so you can check that out if you want to want to look at it, but we can spend a lot of time talking about line of position one, that God exists. Let me give you line of position two. The second line of position is this, that God interacts with people. God interacts with people. First line of position says that God exists. We see creation. We begin to understand things, not just does God exist, but God must be pretty powerful. Must be pretty capable, pretty able. Second line of position, we begin to understand that not only does God exist, he's powerful, but that God exists, he's personal, because he interacts with people. Now the phrase I'm going to use throughout the rest of this message is this. We're going to call this interaction that God has with human beings a God encounter. A God encounter. Just at a party last week, three older brothers, and it was one of their birthday parties, and I got involved in a conversation with uh, one of uh, his friends. This person began to talk about God and uh, had very different ideas than I did about that. But one of the things that stood out, I think, most prominently to me is this person talked about how God had interacted with her, how it was undeniable that He was there, but also that he was interested in her well-being. She had a God encounter. Now, if you read the Bible from beginning to end, you're going to find a series of God encounters. What I want to do today is I want to look at what is probably the most well-known God encounter in the entire Bible. And that is the story of when God calls Moses. You guys know this story? That's a great story. I'm just going to read a few verses, actually several chapters long. But I'm just going to read the first four verses. And in those verses, as we're going through, I want to ask a question of all of us today. And it is, if God does really encounter people, if he interacts with people, what does that look like? What are the characteristics of that? How do I know if if God is kind of knocking at my door, if if God is sort of intersecting my life and speaking to me directly? Now, it's my belief, and I'm going to take time to prove this, but it's my belief that everyone has God, a God encounter of some kind. That God sets up things, as we'll see in a minute, to bring people to this intersection where they have an encounter with God. God sets up the pieces. And as they encounter with God, God speaks something to them, and he's trying to do something there. Now let's, uh, let's read the first four verses of the story of Moses. It's up on the screen. It begins in chapter 3 of the book of Exodus, and it says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, And he led the flock to the far side of the desert 
and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Now, he's in the uh, Sinai Peninsula. It's very hot. It's very flat. It's vast. There's a few uh, uh, kind of smaller mountain ranges, but it is as barren uh, and hot as a place could be on planet Earth. That's where he finds himself. And it goes on. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him. Now, look at this. In flames of fire from within a bush, Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Now let's talk about what a God encounter looks like. If you were to look at all of the God encounters of the Bible, you're going to find essentially four characteristics that always stand out. Here's the first one. You ready to write? First thing that we need to understand about God encounters, and this comes out of this story in clear ways, is that God encounters seem to always come at unlikely times, unexpected moments. It's not something that we're anticipating as a rule. Now Moses, Moses, if you know the story of him, was in line to be the most powerful human being on earth. He had been rescued out of the Nile by the daughter of Pharaoh as an infant. There's a whole story about that if you want to read it. But as you read that story, you begin to see that God has had his hand on Moses from the very beginning. God has set up some things. Pharaoh's daughter finds Moses, draws him out of the Nile, takes him home to be her son. He's raised and educated in the most powerful place on earth at that time, the palace of Pharaoh of Egypt. Egypt is a superpower in the ancient world, a, a, an absolute astonishing power. They, they come into the Iron Age and all of this stuff before everybody else, meaning their technology is way beyond everyone else. Think of the superpowers of our day compared to like undeveloped nations, what that's like. That was Egypt with everybody else. Moses was educated. He was groomed to be the next pharaoh. And roughly at the age of 40, because he couldn't control himself, he finds himself in a conflict. And in the conflict, he gets angry and he kills another Egyptian, punishable by death. Moses had it all. He was lined up for the seat of power on planet Earth. And because of his own moral failings, he loses everything. It's discovered what he did, so he runs away and hides in the desert. As he's living in the desert, he meets a woman. He marries her and begins to work for his father-in-law. Imagine you're the head of Apple. And you go down to run in your father's business, father-in-law's business. He doesn't even have anything to call his own. He's not tending his sheep. He's tending his father-in-law's sheep. He's got nothing. He goes from everything to nothing. And I kind of wonder, as Moses is walking through the desert tending these sheep, decades have gone by now, does he kick himself does he feel lots of regret and remorse for all of these terrible mistakes he's made? He has no one to blame but himself. As he walks along in the desert all by himself in this vast wilderness, tending these crummy sheep, does he say to himself, man, I, I have really blown it. Nobody's made more mistakes than I have. I've really fouled up my life. I've, really, I've lost everything, absolutely everything. Does he kick himself and does he, does he find just this self-disgust, this anger with himself? Does he find himself moving to tears at some point because he realizes what he's given up? And we don't know. The scripture doesn't tell us his thoughts. It just tells us that he's gone from everything to nothing. And that he's done that because of his own lack of self-control, his own moral failing. 
It is at that moment as an elderly man now, probably coming to the conclusion, well, I guess this is the rest of my life, he's resolved that this is it for him. That God decides to reach out to Moses. Not when Moses is doing everything right. Not when he's lined up to be number one in the, in the land. Not when he's put all of his theological thinking in order. Or he's doing everything he's supposed to do. God doesn't reach out to the guy that's got it all together. God reaches out to the greatest loser on planet earth at that moment. Do you hear what I'm saying? It is unexpected what God is about to do in Moses' life. There's no way he can anticipate what's going on. He's at an absolute low point. I want you to hear what I'm saying today. Moses is at an absolute low point of life and has probably just given up. And at that unexpected moment of his life, God starts knocking on Moses' door. God encounters come at unexpected times. And the second thing I want you to see is this. God encounters are always initiated by God. Always initiated by God. Moses isn't looking for a God encounter. Moses is hiding in the desert so that he's not killed by Egypt. Moses isn't anticipating what's about to happen. I think his heart was open. His father-in-law is the priest of Midian, meaning that he probably was engaged in some kind of worship activity under his father-in-law's leadership. I think his heart is open to God. But he certainly isn't, at least the text doesn't show us this, really throwing himself into, into finding God. It's not something he's trying to conjure up. You know, you, you can go to a lot of kind of religious places and stuff, and, and you can hear people make sort of this claim. Hey, if, if you will do A, B, and C, God will do this for you. It's called prosperity theology. Largest church in America, that's their message. If you'll do A, B, and C, God is sort of on the hook to do this for you. And usually that involves sending them money. And you guys are totally close to that, right? I just need to know. <laughs> if you'll do this, that, and that, God will reach down and do whatever you want him to do. Like God is a giant vending machine in the sky, and you put those coins of faith and religious duty in, and then God's going to give you whatever you want. It doesn't work like that. God is God, and you're not. But in God's love, he chooses to reach out to individuals, to interact with them. God encounters are always initiated by God. Now, you know what's awesome about that? Just that one single thought is this. God wants to encounter you. Moses isn't doing anything. I don't have to say, oh, man, God is never going to help me. God is, has wants nothing to do with me because my life is so bad. Your life is nowhere as bad as Moses was. No matter what you've done. You're golden compared to Moses. Don't think of Moses as this great leader. Think of him as life's biggest loser, because that's what he was. That's what the Bible tells us about him. Your life is fantastic compared to Moses. But God doesn't initiate with the people who are winning. God initiates with people, because he loves them. And it's not about you getting your life together. It's more about having an open heart to the Lord. It's more about being willing to respond. Now, we're going to get to that in a minute. Let me give you the third thing. Third aspect about a God encounter, along with them coming at unexpected times and God initiating them, is this. And this might sound like a no-brainer, but let me explain it. God encounters are, are always out-of-the-ordinary experiences. Always out of the ordinary experiences. For Moses, it was a bush that was burning. He sees the smoke and he goes, I got to go see what that is. And he walks over to where the bush is burning because he sees the flame, but he doesn't see the bush being consumed by the fire. It's out of the ordinary for him. Probably seen smoke rising up on the desert floor where he lives and where he takes care of his father-in-law's stuff. But what he's never seen, what he's never encountered, is a bush on fire that doesn't burn up. 
Now, this is important for a couple of reasons, but really the primary reason I'm trying to draw this out is this. It's very easy to want to do what I want to do and say, well, God told me so. You know what I'm saying? It's very simple to believe that God wants me to have my way and therefore sort of put God's imprimatur, God's stamp of approval on that. And one of the things that God continually calls down Israel for is that they kind of raise up prophets who say, oh, Everything's great. You know, you don't need to worry about a thing. God, God is going to do this. God is going to do that. Making all these promises for God that God never made himself. God encounters are obvious because you will experience something that's different. Now, it might not be a bush that doesn't get consumed by flames, but there is a weightiness when God begins to knock on your door. There's something that gets your attention. Just like God got Moses' attention. Something that is undeniable. When Pastor Wayne was in the the, uh, Navy, he had a friend who was a corpsman. The corpsman told Pastor Wayne that he was an atheist. Didn't believe in God. But as they talked uh, about this and that, their jobs and, and family and all this kind of stuff... This friend of Pastor Wayne, this corpsman, began to describe how in his line of work, uh, medical, that's what corpsmen do, taking care of people, helping them with their uh, physical problems, that he had seen, quote, miracles, unquote. And when he began to describe the miracles he saw, Pastor Wayne said, well, isn't that kind of outside of your worldview? If you don't believe in God, how can you believe there are miracles? Because miracles infer that God is doing something out of the ordinary. And it was through through that conversation that this friend of Pastor Wayne finally gave his life to Jesus Christ. See, he didn't even know it. But he was intersecting with God. Who, as he's trying to do his thing to help people, he sees things happening that are not explainable by medical science. And all he can do is stand back and go, wow, I don't believe in God, but that's cool. You know, he has no idea that God in his love is knocking at this man's door. That God is showing him that he's real, that he's powerful, but also that he's personal. He's having a God encounter without even understanding it until God arranged events For this man to talk to a Christian brother who can say, well, let's think about the experience, the encounter you've had. Now, it's not always a miraculous thing, but it's always something that's out of the ordinary for you. And it just kind of seems, as you read the story of Moses, as you look at the other God encounters of the Bible, as you talk to people, that, like I said before, God seems to kind of arrange events behind the scenes. He uses life in such a way that it brings us to a crossroads. And when we hit this crossroads, that's the moment when God begins to make himself obvious. Sometimes it can just feel like a weightiness in you, a prompting, a nudging. You know, I've heard people tell about miracles and stuff they've seen. But I think uh, uh, often it's just a sense you have that something outside of yourself is knocking on the door of your life, is pulling at you a little bit. Now, we have the ability as free will creatures to hit that crossroads, to have God come in and knock on the door and say, no thanks, nobody's home, and keep going. I think in those cases, God just begins to work in new ways to bring us to that crossroads again. It is my opinion, not everybody's, it's my opinion that God spends a person's entire life trying to bring them to crossroad after crossroad to crossroad for that person to finally come to know God. Why does he do that? Love. Because he loves. And people can say no to God over and over and over until it seems like at some point God just lets a person have their way. God in his love interacts with people. He brings about encounters with himself. Let me give you the third, or the fourth, excuse me. And this kind of underlays the whole thing here. 
Fourth thing we need to know about God encounters is that God encounters just in of themselves contain a call to action. When God comes knocking on a person's door, God's whole intent is that that person will open that door. That that person will respond to God. Now, for Moses, when he has this God encounter, God tells him a couple of things. But as they talk through, and again, you can read in in the first chapters of Exodus, God says to Moses, an old man now, having given up and resolved that life will always be tending and taking care of his father-in-law's stuff, uh, who has given up everything for nothing, God calls this one who's hiding from Egypt to go back to Egypt. God encounters, when God begins to call, hear me now, always involve a level of risk. That's called walking by faith. Will I respond in faith to what God is prompting me to do, or will I not? Will I open the door and say, yes, God, or will I shut the door and say, no, thank you? Is there faith there, or is there not faith there? Moses responds. Now, it takes him a while. He has a long conversation with why he should not respond to God. God talks him through some things. Because God is gracious and loving. And after a course of time, Moses finally says, yes, Lord, I'll go. And you maybe know the rest of the story. You can read about it in the, the Exodus and the next several books of the Bible, how God uses this fearful, broken, elderly man to change the course of history. It is an amazing, epic story. But really what I, I just so much want us to grab tonight, or today, excuse me, this morning, is that um, God doesn't pick a hero. You know what I mean? God doesn't look for the greatest person he can find, the the most successful, got, got the act together person. God just calls a person. And when he calls this person, this person's heart is open enough to respond. And God doesn't say, okay, Moses, uh, you have really fouled up. You need to go back. There's a lot of apologizing you need to do. You need to clean up your act. You need to change these things. You know, there's such terrible characteristics in your life. You need to change all of these things. God doesn't do that. God just simply, in effect, says, Moses, here's what I'm calling you to do. I'm here. I know you. I want you to know me. And when you come to me, I want to use you for something bigger than you can possibly imagine. That's what a call from God looks like. And when God starts working in your life, those God encounters you've had or are having or will have, they're going to be exactly the same thing. That out of the ordinary experience, that sense, that presence, that weightiness, whatever it looks like, where God is saying, I'm here, I know you, and I want you to know me. Will you respond in faith? Will you open the door and say yes? Moses had a lot of questions. There's a lot of things that Moses didn't know were going to happen. He had a lot of of concerns and and fears and even complaints about what God was doing. Moses didn't just jump in the boat and say, let's go get him, Lord. Moses had all kinds of uh, just concerns and worries about what this would look like. But what Moses did was basically respond. Just simple faith, that much faith. Jesus said, faith the size of a mustard seed. You could hardly see it. Just enough to say yes. So I want to pray for us. And and as I'm praying, I just want to ask you that question. Is God saying to you, I'm here, I know you, and I want you to know me? Is he knocking on your door? Not that you have all the answers. Not that you don't have questions or concerns or even fears or worries. God encounters you because he loves you. God reaches out to you because he wants you. He calls you to a relationship with himself. Your job is not to get everything right or figure everything out. That's not your job. Your job is just to say, yes, God, I see you, I hear you, and I want you. It's called faith.
So let's, uh, let's pray together. We're going to be done for this morning. If you want to talk, you want to pray, you have more questions, I'll be up here. Some other people will be up here if you, you want to do that. Let's pray. I just want to bless you guys right now. Father, we thank you so much for uh, just the beautiful stories in the Bible that help us understand truths about you. God, you've reached out to us because we, we weren't able to reach out to you. And in your greatness and your love and your grace, you reach out to us in all of our imperfections and all of our mistakes and all of our regrets and all of our confusion. In your love, you just reach out and grab hold of us. You draw us to yourself. And you call us to respond by simple faith to you. Thank you that that's how you are, Lord. And thank you, Father, that that really is the picture of Jesus. God in the flesh coming to earth to call people back, to bring people back into a relationship with you. So, Father, this morning, I would just pray that anyone who's never made that first step of faith by giving their life to Jesus, personally giving themselves to Jesus, saying, yes, Lord, I, I know you're there and, and I want you. Father, I pray that this morning you would give them whatever they need to be able to take that step of faith, that first beautiful wonderful step of faith back into a relationship with you. Father, I thank you for this morning. and Just pray your great blessing over everyone who is here. Blessing for, uh, for today and for a good week. And, and heart, Lord, for hearts that are open to, to you and all that you're saying, how you're calling us to respond. Lord, bless these people today, I would pray. Pray all of this in the perfect name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you guys today. Have a great day.